Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and this is a show where you can have your property related questions answered by our team of property experts. And joining me today is John Howard, property developer, mentor, author, investor and heaven knows what else. You always make it sound that I'm really busy. Well, I think you are. Probably, yeah. We have enough trouble, you're getting you in the studio. <laughs> anyway, good to see you, Thank John. Thank you. Um, and uh, joining John for the first time is Vincent Wong, who is a property entrepreneur and investor. Vincent, welcome to you. Thank you very much. Hope you've had a good journey in and it's not been too much trouble. It's not been too bad at all. Good. Okay. And you've, you've come in from Milton Keynes? Milton Keynes, yes. Well done. Okay. <laughs> Jolly good. Well, you made it. That's the thing. So, Vincent, I'm going to start with you. Um, and the first question is this. Do the panel think that despite banks' requirements to make pre-construction sales as a prerequisite for development funding, the days of extensive off-plan purchases are over, given the volatility of new, the new homes market, caused in the main by higher interest rates and huge rises in material costs. Well, you made it sound like uh, before 2008, when that was the height of the new build and off-plan investment, it was like a bonanza. Mm. It wasn't really. I mean, most of the purchases of these off-plan properties were retail buyers who were really not so knowledgeable about what they were getting into. I mean, for example, they were negotiating these sort of bulk purchases with big discounts. The first thing is discount to what? You know, is it the market value or is it like an inflated yeah. price? What was it in the first place? Well, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So a lot of people just got duped into taking on these properties that all ended up being liabilities because the, the numbers just didn't stack up. I mean, for most of these investors, their cash flow were in negative, which means paying off the mortgage each month, they're actually out of pocket. So it, effectively, they had liabilities in their hands. So now, I mean, with a uh, sort of high cost and, and all the uncertainties of interest rates, the developer is just going to pass all the costs on to the new buyers. So for me, it's never a great investment if you're not a seasoned investor and thinking that you can get into buy to let and get great discounts from developers. It's never been the case. Well, I think a couple of things on this on, on this pre-construction sales or purchases. There's two things really. I think anybody that can judge what their finances are going to be like, in other words, their ability to, to buy the property two or three years in <coughs> advance in these times is it, pretty brave really. And again, you know, your point about, well, whatever was the value, truthfully, um, I have to go back, I'm just, I'm just thinking now, probably 25 years, and I won't mention the development, but uh, the, the developer in, in, in the case had actually paid rent a crowd to queue up on Tower Bridge. Not such a bad idea. Yeah, yeah. Look, no. Looking like they wanted yeah. to, you yeah. know. Excellent. And, and the prices were going up by the minute. So whatever the real price is, heaven knows. I mean, you're just really taking a punt. If you're two or three years ahead, you're taking a punt on what the market's going to do, aren't you, realistically? Mm. And some have, some have come off and some haven't. But, you know, since 2000, since 2000 say, 13, things settled down a bit more with that, with that type of uh, a long t well, say long-term investment. It's two or three-year investment, really, isn't it? But, of course, people were selling them on before they had to pay for them which was the trick before that, wasn't it, in the, before 2008? I think when the market was going up furiously, which was the case yeah. then, you can't go wrong with property because you, you exchange contracts two to three years prior, yes. the chances you may make money uh, when the development completes, but, but you it's do not know, the case now. No, you do know, you have to know when to jump off the merry-go-round, though. Yes. Well, I, I At the right time. Timing's um, everything. But, yeah, John, you know, this business of, of, of buying off plan, of course, after 2008, wasn't it, um, the government said no, no more mortgages for people who were passing on contracts only. So it became impossible to, well, I, to sell them. Yeah, well, I think the trick with the developers was the 30% deposit, wasn't it, I think? Um, um, sort of gifted deposit. Yeah, the 30% right. deposit, which then the developer used to actually build the... Yeah, yeah. build the yeah. development out that was yeah. that was their share of the deposit for the bank in the end and I think a lot of people got into difficulties and at the moment you know we're buying quite a lot of stock off developers who, who you know who, who have gone bankrupt so 
you know, and some have been sold off plan and aren't ready and, oh my Lord, you know, it is a problem. Yeah. I suppose, um, I, I, I suppose just coming back to the original question, um, are the banks, I mean, actually both of you really, are the, are the banks still insisting on this percentage of pre-sales before they'll fund the development? Is it, is it still prevalent? That I'm not aware of, but one thing for sure is that banks actually don't give the full loan to value. Like back in yeah. 2008, you have um, overvaluation, yeah. uh, irresponsible lending. I can name a company like Inside Track, you know, yeah. flogging lots yeah. of useless properties. And, and then um, Northern Rock giving yeah. loans up to 100 and 120 yeah. percent loan to value. Yeah, I remember that. They they and went bust as well. Right, and then they were encouraging all yeah. the. Uh, uh, rigs valuers to yeah. to lift the uh, yeah, valuations because, because they needed to, to lend the money what I would say is what I would say is of course if you've got the big enough deposit yourself as a developer the, the, the none of that comes you into you don't need it anyway no. so I think that's no. the key I think people have been developing property because they can get a hundred percent they get central percent loan to value plus a hundred percent of the bill costs mm it encourages the wrong people to start developing. Yeah. And when there's an overrun, they haven't got that cash behind them to pay for any overrun, yep. and the bank won't do it, so it ends up in receivership. In tears. In tears, and then mm, hopefully yeah. we come along and make an offer. Okay, all right. All um, part. So we'll move on to the second question, which is for you, John. Yeah. And this is a favourite subject of yours. Is it time for green belt policies to be oh, reviewed by the goodness. government rather than local authorities as the need for more housing becomes even more desperate? OK, so uh, green belt came in originally in London in 1937 and across the rest of the country in 1947, or was it 1936 and 1947? Anyway, 11-year gap between the two. Did you remember that well, John? I did, yeah. Uh, I was busy at the time, so <laughs> very funny. Uh, so uh, it's been around far, far too long without being changed. So there's areas that I think are in green belt that shouldn't be, and there's areas that aren't in green belt that probably should be. So it needs a, a total review. This government haven't had the balls to do it because every time they try and change anything, there's uproar amongst their MPs especially in the south of the country, whereas Labour will be able to look at it with fresh eyes and I think will come up uh, with a, a new plan, and, a, and they need to. And the one question I was ask you, Stephen, what can you build in Greenbelt? What can you? Yes. Car parks? I think I've mentioned this to you before and you've remembered it, so well done, Stephen. <laughs> you can build, no, a, a, the council I, I can thought build, that was the, only the council can well, build oh, sorry, and a park, park and ride. Park and ride, yeah. Can you believe that? Yeah. I see, uh, you can cover it with tarmac and buses. It's absolutely bonkers. And we looked at a scheme where we're trying to relocate Cambridge United Football Club because we owned it for a while um, into an area that was, was meant to be, it was Greenbelt, but it was actually an old, an old, um, Rubbish tip, and it was actually in Greenbelt. Absolutely crackers. But again, John, since the um, introduction of Greenbelt, architectural standards have raised so so far above what they were in those times. Really? Well, I think so. Do you, Do you think I don't so? know whether you agree. No, I don't know. I, I, I just think the buildings that we build today look amazing. Or perhaps I'm just a bit, being a bit too London-centric, am I? But I, I think a lot I th round here don't look too I clever in my view. I don't know what you, I don't know what, what you. What I haven't seen many nice things built in a countryside where, at all. I don't know where I don't honest. know where you've been looking. Just <laughs> oh, looking out the window now. I think it's quite spectacular. Well, I guess taste is very subjective, isn't it? That's a very yeah. subtle, very <laughs> subtle way of putting it, Vincent. I wouldn't be so kind as that, but there you go. But you know, do you, do you not think that we're more capable of being um, capable of sympathetic development? these days. I mean, we, we spend a lot of time talking about sort of green innovations. We do, we do have planning authorities that take great care about, you know, f visual. Well, of course, they will let you have, allegedly, but I haven't seen many that got, got planning, they will let you have a house 
potentially in green belt, but it's again very difficult to do anything in green belt that has ar architectural merit. Mm. It's a special house, and one or two people have got away with building some, you know, very well designed, very different looking houses in, in areas that they wouldn't normally get planning in. But that's they're like you know one in a million, aren't they? I don't, I, I, I don't. To be fair, Stephen, I quite often do agree with you. I think, I think when it comes to the quality of uh, housing in this country, it's all pretty bland. Mm. Not where you live, obviously, but. Do you see, I told you we'd have a little bit of banter, didn't I? Absolutely, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> yeah. um, no, John, I, 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 I just, I just think the. The way we've introduced new materials, new standards of building, new standards of architecture in, into our economy have been, have been quite good. I mean, I think probably uh, uh, Prince Charles, as he was then, was the instigator of that, yeah, especially was gonna say, in yeah. London. And it, it just made us think a little bit more about what we were building and where we were building it. And I, I have to say, most of the areas that object to building on uh, um, th these sort of areas, the houses that those people live in were at one time fresh and new and being built in very close to Greenbelt proximity. Look at Milton Keynes where I live. Well, exactly. Or used to be a, an ugly building and now is an icon because it's, yeah, yeah. the shopping centre itself is listed. I mean, Just think about that, that ugly concrete bill. Flat roof, is it? Uh, flat roof, yeah, completely throughout. No, I was just, I was just now it's listed. How bonkers yeah. is that? <laughs> we're, we're just talking off, off, off air about Milton Keynes. And, and, you know, at the time, I can remember when Milton Keynes was effectively created as a yeah, new town. It was, yeah. And, and, and the cry was, oh, well, it's going to be impersonal, it's not interesting, it's not architecturally interesting. Uh, it took got, a lot of stick no, for me. It's got no, it's, it's got no it's soul. Still isn't, Stephen. Still isn't, Stephen. <laughs> but it's convenient. I think it's good for raising families. And yeah. it's relatively cheap compared to London. It's yeah. commutable. Yeah. You know. yeah. And the other reason that why are so many houses are bland, of course, it's so expensive to build anything but bland. Mm. You know, it's okay in London, you can afford to build something a bit, a bit nicer. But everywhere else in the country, because of the cell, cell values, you I'm can not, only really sure build... Pretty basic bog standard. Well, I'm not sure if it's down to the cost because if you go to continental, continental Europe, you go to countries like um, you know Scandinavia, you see a lot of housing, not the high end ones. They look aesthetically but they are expensive. Beautiful. I mean, you're talking about the one the highest tax, uh, tax it's, it's also countries true. in the world, yeah. isn't it? I yeah. mean, <laughs> there is that. Uh, it's a difficult one. I, I mean, I can see what you're saying, Vincent, but... OK, well... well for a start, nobody used PVC windows. No, no, I agree. They've got more a bit classy, yeah, yeah. shall we say. On the note of high taxation, we'll leave it there. So that's all, we've got, that's all we've got time for in this half of the show. So join me again after the break when we'll be asking Vincent and John more of your questions. Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Question Time and I'm joined by Vincent Wong and John Howard. And uh, Vincent, your second question is, let to let is a fairly recent innovation in the rental market, but as some of those early deals are now coming to a contractual end with vendors being left high and dry, with let to let operators being unable to raise the funds to purchase the property at the end of the contract's life, do the panel think that regulatory uh, protections should be in place to cover these schemes. Now, um, w we have talked about this before, you and I, um, about this, and there is a difference between those schemes where somebody will come along and say, look, I'll, I'll rent the place for five years and I'll buy it at the end, or those that simply just do a, a pure rental a, a agreement. And I do yeah. understand the difference, yeah. Yeah. But, but perhaps you could explain to our viewers the difference between the two. Well, you're absolutely right. Um, Stephen, rent to rent has been quite an extraordinary thing in, in terms of the popularity. Now, everyone's talking about rent to rent being similar to like a get rich quick scheme uh, from the retail point of view. I have to say is anything but. Um, I've, I've come across so many people who've lost great deal of money investing into these schemes without fully understanding what, what they do. I mean, the, let's look at just a, a, an investor having to take on a five bedroom property in Birmingham, for example, right? The whole idea is to rent out each room separately in order to get, you know, a high rental. 
And then even if you rent out the rooms for 500, uh, 100 pounds per room, you're, you're thinking, okay, 500 pounds per week, just over two grand a month, um, and I'll pay the landlord 1300, then I, I'm gonna get 700 pounds profit. Mm. But it's never that straightforward. That's the gross, isn't it? Uh, that's the gross, right? Mm. So unbeknownst to them, you're gonna have to spend quite a lot of money to make sure if you're letting it out as an HMO, it, it's gonna cost money to put fire doors and communal areas. And so there's a few grand down the pan. And then also uh, you're responsible for all the utility bills. Just imagine heating up a five bedroom house. It's got, especially these days, it's gonna cost four or 500 pounds. So what you're left with is a, a net profit of maybe 300 pounds. And you might think, okay, if I want to have 3,000 pounds of, of, of income per month, I'll just take on 10 of these because it's free. But by then, you, you're making three grand. I'm right? shuddering at this point. Right? Me too. And, Me uh, too. And, then you, and then you're managing 50 tenants. I, I don't know how you feel about managing five tenants, let alone 50. Well, let someone else do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to make the, three grand. The tenant churn must be phenomenal, oh. isn't it? Yeah, so for a start, it's not a passive income as they no. make, uh, make out. out. Yeah. Nor is it an investment because when a property increases in value, which is why investors invest in the first place, mm -hmm. you don't benefit from a penny of it. No. So how is it an investment? So for me, rent to rent is mostly I couldn't put in a better word, a scam. Well, I think you're being a little bit harsh there because I think there are, there are, everybody's got, everybody who, who does it has got an example of someone that's, that's done okay with it. But I agree with you on the whole, Vincent, you're right. The one, the one thing I would say is when I was doing bedsits years, and, and there were bedsits in those days years ago, we had coin meters, five pences, that's how long ago it was, then 10, then 50 pence. I wasn't born then. You weren't so, born then, yeah. Vincent. But, but basically, <laughs> you covered all your energy of, of costs by having a, a coin meter, and you make you ratchet up, you had a bit of a profit on it as well. I've lived in now one I, of those bets before. Yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. So, yeah. so I think, to be fair, maybe that's going to come full circle, and people will then charge for the, the energy and so on. Of course, they've all got caught out in the last 24 months, haven't they, on that? I think what we need to look at is the reason why the, the landlord or vendor wishes to partake in such a scheme to begin with. Yes. I mean, what's the motivation behind it? Yeah. I mean, if, if it's just simply uh, wanting not to pay your mortgage for a number of months, then fine. Yeah. But most rent to rent is actually done illegally because if you look at the mortgage uh, terms and conditions, um, subletting is not actually allowed. You'd never, you'd never get permission from the landlord. No, you yeah. can't. No. Uh, if you use a separate agreement, like a management agreement, that's fine. But from an investment point of view, unless I have an option to buy the yes. property, then it's worth my while because I'm not getting a lot of cash flow, but I can fix the price at which I can buy the property for the next 10 years. You In the meantime, I pay off the seller's mortgage. Yeah, you can, Vincent, but if I'm going to give you a five-year option, it's not going to be cheap, I'm afraid. Why, why would you even charge me anything? I'm paying your mortgage for you. I'm paying off your liability. Thank you. All right, think, think about that. Yeah. So if you're struggling to pay a mortgage, yeah. it won't be long before the bank knocks on your door and takes your property away. But Which if I can- Takes the property off someone else as well in that case. Exactly. Rent rent. So, so it needs to be a win-win situation, yeah. but it's definitely not for the retail market. You don't really understand yeah. Yeah. what they're getting into. Um, and, and usually one party will lose big time, yes. just, just like you said. They're expecting the, the investor to exercise the right to buy the property, but, but they can't raise finance. Yeah, because they want too much for it. Right, so it's an empty promise. So, so Vincent, just to try and answer the question, um, <laughs> <laughs> do we think- I that, thought he had. Do, yeah. do, do we think that protection should be put in? I, I just don't think um, <coughs> regulation uh, is always the answer. I just think, um, People just need to understand what they're getting themselves into. You can't have government intervention for everything that goes wrong. I think education is more important than intervention. Good point. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, John, uh, there does seem to be from both political parties an amount of rowing back from green elements of property development. For example, the change to hydrogen gas seems to have been dropped. Do the experts think this trend will continue in, in an attempt to keep housing costs down? 
particularly with perhaps a new government on the way? Well, I think, I think the current government is being very sensible because all these ideas were put in place a few years ago and, and you know, uh, get rid of gas boilers by 2030, wasn't it, I think, and, and get rid of oil boilers, oil boilers by 2025. I mean, I live in the country. Many, many people rely on oil being delivered. Mm. Sure. What on earth would happen to all the companies that deliver the oil if, they, if you ban the boil? It's absolutely bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. And we all want to do our bit to, for the environment. All of us do. I, I don't think there's anyone I've met who doesn't want to try and do their bit for the environment. However, the cost of, um, the, cost of the change of all these things in such a, over such a short period of time mm. is, is, is a massive challenge. And I think... Unfortunately, when La if, if and when, and it sounds like when, Labour get in, they, they've already said they're going to bring back the 2030 business about cars and, and, um, and so on. And I was talking, I sat next to an um, a, a, a MP at an event about a year ago, and he stood up to talk and he said, if, if, if we all have electric cars, we need four times the amount of electric energy in the UK than we've got now mm. just to cope with it. And of course, they're then going to have to tax it like they do petrol and oil because otherwise they, they, they lose revenue. Very, yeah. The whole thing is an absolute farce. Well, it, it, it is a bit of a farce, isn't it? It's not so long ago we were all told to buy diesel cars, weren't we? Because well, you bought an electric car, I bought an electric yeah, car, yeah. I've done my bit, but I'm getting rid of my electric car. <laughs> well, I've got rid of mine. You've got rid of yours. <laughs> so, you know... <laughs> And and we, been a we, only bought, we only bought them because, because of the tax breaks you get, by the way, well, Vincent. Yeah, but anyway. Yeah, but you know, I, I mean, I think it was one of the first people. To, I, I bought a hybrid. Yeah. Okay. And it was very good at the time because you, you could go into London without the congestion charge. I think London it might work. It doesn't work anywhere um, else. Yeah, but, but very quickly, as soon as, as soon as they became popular, whoosh, the, all the incentives went. Yes. And I think the same will happen with electric cars. Well, I mean, at the, at the moment, you can go into the West End in London and you can have about four hours parking for sort of 20 odd P if, you're, uh, if you've got an electric car. You don't think that's going to last. No. I mean, it's just not, is it? The revenue's got to come yeah. from somewhere, right? Absolutely. You get no congestion charge. That's not going to last. I mean, I, 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 is it £16 now, I think, the congestion charge? I mean, it's quite a big chunk. So the revenue drop must be huge. So it's not, it's not going to last. And, and this, I, I mean, just going back to your point on the last question about government intervention, I think we've got to be very careful about the government sort of saying, oh, let's go hydrogen, hydrogen gas for people's kitchens and things. Well, one, it is a bit dangerous, isn't it? You know, well, I think the clue's it, really, the clues in the name, isn't it, with the H? <laughs> yeah. um, you know. Explosions. <laughs> yeah, and that village that they were setting up to, to go on yeah. hydrogen gas, they've cancelled that scheme now. They say it's too volatile, it's too dangerous. Yeah. So I think you've got to be very, very careful about government interference. You need a, a proper alternative before you cancel something, yeah. don't you? Yeah. And get rid of it. Yeah, difficult. And also, it's not cheap to develop and implement, is it? No. Hydrogen, um, especially the, the, the green hydrogen, it's got to cost three times as much. And that means it's got to be years before you actually get your return. And it's all got to be repiped, hasn't it? Yeah, well, we, yeah, we, yeah. We, we, we did a scheme for 24 conversions, and I don't think it works for conversions. We had um, the, the heat exchange pumps, you know, the, the fans that. It's a bit like air conditioning, but the other way around. Damn great things outside every front door. They're quite noisy. And then for, for a conversion, which hasn't got the best insulation in the world, not very, yeah. not very warm, to be quite honest. And, and, and for us to put them in, we were forced to by the local authority, expensive. Mm. But uh, when, when you're doing a refurbishment, if you put the heat pump in, you, you're more than likely to have to renew the radiators and the piping oh, yeah. around the house, aren't yeah. you, as well? Yeah, absolutely. So it's not the 20 or 30 grand for the heat pump, it's the... Yeah. It's the it, it, it really the doesn't work at the moment. OK, well, look, that's all we've got time for. So I'm going to say a big thank you to John Howard. Thank you for coming Pleasure. in, John. Vincent Wong, I hope your first experience of it's filming It's been amazing, thank you very much. Did very well. <laughs> well, you did very well. Great, great information you've um, given out there. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Stephen Galpin. Join me again next time on Property Question Time.